Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler's coverage of the president, the vice presidential debate carried for you by CNN Philippines. Joining us today on the Rappler panel, on my right, you see Ateneo Professor. He's the head of the Development Studies Program of Ateneo, Jail Cornelio. He's also with the Philippine Sociological, Philippine Society. Sociological Society. So we're looking at him for a sociological perspective of what's happening. What does this show about us? On, across from him, you see her as a familiar face. We love hearing her perspectives of media and society. You see University of the Philippines, the College of Mass Communications professor, Clarissa David. Next to me, a familiar face. Um, old uh, face. She says old, but <laughs> old and always young. Rappler's editor-at-large, Marites Vitug. You're, we're coming to you live from the Rappler offices. And you'll see behind me, everyone is hard at work in terms of putting this coverage together. When the debate begins, you can see on the same stream the, the broadcast of CNN Philippines. And in between, on the breaks, you'll hear from us as well as our reporters and editors here in Rappler. Let's start. Tell me, what are you looking for, Jail, in this, in this vice presidential debate? My expectations are a bit wide, to be honest, um, because uh, I think that the vice presidential competition, I suppose, is, is a it's a very wide game in the sense that um, they can talk whatever they want to, they can pursue whatever they want to, precisely because uh, they don't shape the opinion insofar as the elections are concerned. Uh, of course, because of my interest in inclusive development, in my interest in the peace process, and my interest in youth affairs, I would be looking for these things um, during the debates. Okay. And, and Clarissa, in terms of what the vice presidential, the campaigns have been, uh, what do you see are the themes coming out of this race? The, 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 some of the themes have been interesting because the moment somebody decided to run without a presidential tandem, mm -hmm. it suddenly became interesting mm -hmm. because you have to package him differently. You have to figure out how you're going to run the vice presidential race. But at the same time, historically in the Philippines, people don't put people in the uh, presidential and vice presidential candidates in True. the same ticket together True. often. Yes. Uh, so historically, vice presidential campaigns have been run almost independent of presidential exactly. campaigns. Yeah. Uh, the, the way that the Ang Matuid has been doing it where they're tandem is really not the norm if you look from past uh, elections. So the vice presidential race sort of operates separately. It's been interesting because under the radar the until very recently, uh, so. under the radar until very recently, people have been shifting their vote, votes back and forth and now it's a dead heat. It's a dead heat across Two, depending on which poll you're looking it at, is. two or three. So actually, now that you've said that, I want to come with me and look at this poll that we have. I'm going to come on this side. Sorry, Marita. Um, take a look. These are actually the statistical surveys of the different groups. And if you look from time, the orange is Chase Escudero, blue is Alejandro Cayetano, red is Marcos, uh, Robredo, Danny Robredo is purple. Lilianes is brown and green is Gringo Onasa. And if you look at the, when you put all of the statistical surveys together, you actually see that Cheese Escudero and Bongo Marcos are 0.1% apart. 24.8% for Cheese Escudero, 24.7% mm -hmm. for Bongo Marcos. And on that, I'm going to bring it to you, Marites. Is this a surprise? How's, what's your reaction to having these two men be vying for the top spot? Actually, I was surprised by Bong Bong's uh, meteoric rise in the surveys, considering that uh, he carries a very infamous family name, the son of the late dictator. So it was really uh, a shock and a surprise that he's leading um, the polls. So if we look at it, it's like people power happened 30 years ago, mm. so we have an entire generation of voters who have not uh, maybe read up and experienced um, martial law. So it's a challenge, I think, this poses a challenge to academics, yeah. to us in the media, and our educators to, I think, uh, really make our students learn mm -hmm. more about the past, mm -hmm. especially contemporary history. Mm -hmm. well, while you're at it, may I say something on sure, that one? Sure, please. You know, I've, I've been very interested in, in uh, 
the voting patterns or behaviors of young people. And according to recent surveys, what we're actually seeing in Marites is that it's not the young people who are supporting Duterte and, uh, and Bongo Marcos. It's uh, those who are 35 years old and above. Of course, according to a recent survey, it's about 20% who are supporting um, Bongbong Marcos, 18 to 34, around that, you know, that, that age group. And I belong to that age group, so the millennials. I'm an old millennial. But so 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 well, I agree that young people tend to um, be open to re revisionist history. It's also interesting and worth asking why the generation that underwent the martial law and certainly the Edsa revolution are now supporting um, Bongbong -Bong Marcos and Duterte, for that matter. What do you, why do you think? I, I have a very specific hypothesis about that. Yeah. Um, when we change administrations during elections, at least in the literature in other countries shows that what wins a, a voter's allegiance is the candidate is the issue of the day, right? So when right. Aquino was running in 2010, the biggest problem of the country was corruption. It was so rampant, and he ran on the platform of corruption. So now the question is, if we accept an assumption that corruption has improved, it yeah. is no longer the problem, the biggest, most important problem of the country. For many people, the biggest, most important problem is crime. Crime. True. So if you think that crime and order and True. discipline is the problem, the biggest problem that's keeping the Philippines from progressing, if you look across True. the candidates, who is the candidate running on a platform of crime True. and order? That's Duterte and Marcos. Interesting. Your reaction, Marita? No, but I don't know if uh, Bongbong -Bong has emphasized anti-crime and anti. Well, he he's emphasized he, strong man, strong yeah, man kind of. Yes, yes. and that during the martial law years, everybody was disciplined. Yeah. That's right. That's that's close enough. Yes. Yeah, just like yeah, there's no trash in the streets. People follow the rules. Yeah, the nostalgia for yes. the for the glorious past that never existed. So people want order. That's what this is telling us about Filipinos right now. They want a sense of an even playing field. <laughs> is that correct? At the expense of, they're willing to risk having a strong man at the expense mm -hmm. of human rights, mm -hmm. yes. killing a bit mm -hmm. of our freedoms, taking mm -hmm. away a bit of our freedoms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have another hypothesis though. I mean, I, 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 I submit to that. But my other hypothesis has to do with empathy. Um, this administration, we, we give them the credit, right, for yes. everything that they have done, right? yes. uh, economic growth and so on and so forth. But it's not known for empathy, yes. especially the president, right? Yes. Um, so you've got, um, so Duterte, in as much as he is the strong man from Davao, his message has changed in the past weeks, right? Um, now he's standing alongside children, for example. Even Laila de Lima, think about it, right? Laila de Lima, who used to be, you know, who, whose first commercial was with you know, jailing all these criminals, is now saying, I love you, right, to everyone. It's so unexpected of Laila de Lima, right? So, but nevertheless, what we're seeing is that there are clear attempts by the strong men to show, to express empathy. Why does that matter? Um, in our research, I'm part of a big study called Vote of the Poor. Um, it's a follow-up study on what the Institute of Philippine Culture did in 2004. And we uh, collaborated with SWS to conduct a survey around the country about the qualities that, that, that the poor are looking for. And uh, in fact, it's across the board. Um, concern for the poor, empathy, is the most important quality. So yes, people are looking for discipline, but at the same time, they're looking for a mother. So in a way, it's a perfect family, like a good father, but also a good mother. And and the president or the vice president or candidate who sends that message, the dual message, I think would win. Does that so, apply to the mm -hmm. vice presidential oh, candidates? I, 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 because that would be my question. Who, yeah, true. I mean, in true. your work with the poor, who mm -hmm. do they prefer as a vice president? Gosh, uh, well, s well, the surveys already show, right? Um, the, well, the pattern, I suppose, um, well, what's your hypothesis? Well, no, my, 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 what we're looking at is, is there's actually a candidate who has a long history of working for the poor. And this is, and this is the Lenny, Lenny Robredo. Robredo. Oh, okay, right. yeah, sure. Right. Uh, so right. how it has been a challenge for her to get her message right. across 
that she is oh, for right. the poor and Correct. in fact has spent her career in law helping the poor. And part of the reason mm -hmm. why it's difficult mm -hmm. is because she is mm -hmm. running under the Daang Matuyan yeah. platform, sure. which is sure. a good thing in some respects, but creates a challenge because then she carries the baggage of you know, where is that empathy? Yeah, but I, do, I think it's also uh, because we're very personality based in our yeah. politics. She's a new face mm. and she hasn't held any national position. So I think it's introducing herself to the public. This is like her coming out. Sure. So it takes time to really get to know her. Again, it's interesting if you look at this, right? Her rise is pretty That's dramatic, right? That's, right? Right. That's her rise. Just That's like right. Marcos. Like Mark, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Perils. In fact, a little steeper. But then, on this one, you see Cheese Escudero. That's we right. haven't really talked yes. about Cheese Escudero. Yeah. Tell us what what does he stand for? What do people expect from him? Why was he so high? Why this decline, for example? Mm -hmm. Cheese Escudero started off in the race having mm -hmm. most of the votes, the vast majority right. yes. of votes. He was the they best were, known was of them, right? Best known. He, uh, but he never really had a solid platform that he wasn't running on particular issues that he would be strong in. Sure. Uh, and that's and then so as Bongbong Marcos and Lenny Escudero start roving the country, stealing away votes, they're stealing away votes from Chis Escudero. Oh, because in the beginning, Correct. those votes were not, those preferences were not set in stone. They are not rabid supporters. The, the, mm. There are rabid supporters of Bongbong Marcos that they're always going to be there. It doesn't matter if they hold the hand of any other candidate and look into their eyes and see empathy, they will still vote for Bongbong Marcos. Uh, so you have, all of the candidates have a strong base that are unchangeable. I think even though Chis Escudero started off with most of the votes, his base is not that big. Maritas, your reaction? Uh, I seem to see a disconnect between uh, what the voters say are their urgent and important concerns, like the Pulse Asia survey shows, jobs, sure, um, sure. Uh, lower inflation rate, it's all mainly economic, Income. Yes. yet they choose candidates, well everybody says this anyway, but, but to a certain degree. So I don't know if Cheese really stands for this, although he says that their government, if they win, she, he and Grace Poe will have uh, compassion, compassion for the poor. Yeah. No? So, but really, uh, since we don't vote based on platforms and since no, we uh, we, we're into a multi-party system which is bizarre because Bongbong Bong is a nationalista party mm -hmm. who's running with Miriam who belongs to People's Reform Party <laughs> Alan's nationalista party who's running with Duterte who belongs to PDP Laban mm. yeah. so it's bizarre it's so it's really we're looking at people That's and true. what they mean to us personal. That's, true. Personal. That's true at that point in time that they are running Yes. You know, because in many ways, like you know, going back to Escudero, I actually get confused with the message that he is sending, or he has been sending all these yes, years, right? Him, yeah. Right. I mean, um, uh, under Gloria Arroyo, he was the staunch critique, right? Uh, uh, of course, he's got that uh, that, uh, that gravitas, but at the same time, he has supported the RH law. He, he wants to tighten the CCT. He has supported K to twelve and, and and so on and so forth. So. Um, now he's sending this message, message that um, he's all about, uh, you know, government with compassion. Um, because precisely because I think that's what people are looking for, and and can, that matters. Can I ask you about revisionist history? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you brought this up at the very beginning. How is it that uh, that there that we can't decide on what what the history was, and how is this impacting the way the candidates are doing? People didn't write enough books. People didn't write enough books. That's why you guys Sometimes have to write more books. Sometimes it's as simple as that. <laughs> or people have not been yes. reading books. Have not, or people have not been, been reading, reading books. books. I mean, right? you know, there are college students in my university that have that don't know much about martial law, and all they really know they watched from the documentary Batas Militar. That's wow, it. that's it. So is that an indictment that of our is, educational system, though? Isn't this part of history? What people? It is certainly an indictment of the educational system. It is also an indictment of the people who are supposed to be writing the books, <laughs> uh, the people who are supposed to be doing the research and documenting the history. Uh, that is why it is mm. That's why history, as an area of study, is mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it takes a certain kind of skill. Not not just anybody can start writing a history book. Mm -hmm. That you have to learn how to write it, you have to learn how to weigh your sources, you have to learn how to do the complete mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. and then write it in a compelling manner. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. If 
if there was a book <coughs> and we required it in high school, people would read it. Even if they didn't want to, they still would. Right? The same way everybody here has read No Limitang Here and, and El Fili, even if voluntarily we never would. <laughs> this is supposed to be part of our curriculum, and it is. But there's just not enough material out there. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that the Marcoses have published books. True. And they're available, I, I, I am told, in community libraries in various parts of the country. <coughs> this has been produced by the Marcos family years ago. So maybe these are what have been read by yes. many of the adults now. Mm -hmm, yes. mm -hmm. I've got another hypothesis also. I mean, alongside his um, the historical weakness, so, so to speak, um, memory, you know, the creation of memory. Um, I agree, right? If you think about um, how Holocaust is well ingrained among Germans' youth, right? Um, it's a crime to even reimagine what happened in the 1930s and 1940s. In the Philippines, it seems to be a, 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 a fair game also for everyone. Uh, and to me, it's a crime. However, I would also say that it has to do with the role young people have been given post-1986 in political affairs. Of course, you have Gasangulian Kabutaan, you've got the National Youth Commission, and to a certain extent, they're doing a good job. But at the same time, we, are, we must ask ourselves, um, have we allowed young people to participate fully? In Ateneo, our student council, for example, to begin with, nobody votes already for the student council. <laughs> and now, nobody's running for the student council. <laughs> oh, no. so, right? Much worse. We have abandoned it. <laughs> we have abandoned it. The notion I'm, of government. Yeah. Th that's right. I mean, not too long, I mean, not too long ago, I was a student leader. But this is just about le less than 15 years ago when the student council was still okay. Not that it was already. It was very good, but it was okay. Now, um, you see, that in, and it's not just Ateneo. Many other universities are encountering the same thing. This is not isolated to the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, the literature yes. shows that, that the young participation of young people around the world is declining. Yes. One possible explanation is neoliberalism, right? People would rather be working. People would rather pursue social mobility. And in the Philippines, our education system, apart from the weakness of our history classes, has also been geared towards um, training um, a labor force that would work abroad. It's not a it's not a generation of young people who think critically, that's not the expectation. The expectation is that they would become, that's why we have got K-12, right? The expectation is that they would become um, efficient, effective uh, laborers um, uh, for export um, when they graduate from college. So that, that the two, two points, I think. First yeah. is the current media landscape now mm. puts much more power in the hands of citizens than before. So yes. it is easy Action to revise, bring it right? Yes, so it is exactly. easy to revise any yeah. history yeah. as long as you have a Facebook page and right. a popular blog. Yeah. Uh, and then secondly, some of the things that they've been seeing now is we think that there's a decline. Many people were worried that there is this sharp decline in political participation. Mm -hmm. But the question is, maybe we should be changing our definition of political participation. Ah, sure. Because the traditional sure. way we define Sure. Political participation is attending rallies, writing letters to your congressman, doing this and this and that. Mm. It didn't include liking comments, leaving, com leaving comments on the Raptor right. page right. or right. something like this. Sure. So right now, the fields of study are revising the way they measure engagement and Fair participation. Enough. But on the other hand also, this new generation considers politics very differently. They engage sure. with government very differently and how yeah. they consider the role of government is not the same as generations before, right? Um, the issue of, of training a labor force, I think, is more an economic problem because the poor have no choice. They have fair to make enough. money, yeah, right? I, I, even if you, you say that K-12 is, even if we say K-12 is really geared towards training people for jobs, the reality of it is they do need jobs. They, yeah, I sure. mean, we're talking about sure. food on the table, we're talking about education sure. for the future, sure. we're talking about stability and healthcare. Uh, but the policy for sure. export, targeting the export labor market uh, is something that is changeable mm -hmm. and was something that was very mm -hmm. specifically pursued during the Arroyo years. And now we're seeing with some of our studies that while well, jobs definitely is an important, one of the most important concerns for mm -hmm. voters now, mm -hmm. they want jobs here, mm -hmm. right? And that's why I'm, per personally, I'm very confused why 
jobs has not been bigger on the campaign ah, yeah. agenda of people. That's true. Like, why, why are we not talking about jobs? Because we talk about the economy a lot. Yeah. I don't think people understand completely mm -hmm. how tied the economy is to jobs. Because the economic language is about inflation, True. Yes. foreign direct yes. investments, True. expanding the G, you know, True. all of these things. When in reality, when you, for, for voters, yeah. they're talking about jobs. Yes. Is it because we unemployment is less than 10 percent, about 7 percent? So but it's but we have the highest unemployment under, under, yes, under in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Yes, the Southeast highest Asia, underemployment. Six point six percent. That's right. Yeah. Yes. And underemployment is the problem. Underemployment is the problem because yeah. poor, yeah. the poor cannot afford to be unemployed. Total. You know, so the definition of un unemployment in the Philippines, in the official statistics, yeah. is something like if you worked one hour a week, you're officially employed. Wow. So it's very, f yeah, but that's an international point. definition that we really have yeah. to adhere to. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it doesn't really reflect what we need it to reflect, which is to what degree is employment supposed to measure the quality, the quality of life yeah, yeah. of people. Good, good but notice point. that all the candidates, presidential candidates, VP, I think the VP candidates are all talking about an anti-poverty program called CCT. Yes. And they're all saying they'll add something to it. Right. It's no longer a differentiator mm -hmm. for the administration. Yes. Because BNI wants to add something more. Like five Ps. You know? uh, five Ps. Yeah. What's the last P? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, Grace Poe wants to add food. Uh, yes. So, there is, because there is a big market for this kind of talk about yeah, yeah. CCTs. So, for me, I find that very interesting and that even uh, Escudero and the rest have, yes. have weighed in on the issue. And yeah. because there are something like 4.5 million families yes. enrolled in CCT. If they, if they say they're going to discontinue it, that's yes. a lot of votes. That's right. That's families. So the administration seems to count on those votes, or at least part of the calculus. Do you think mm -hmm. that's a correct? I mean, will you see those votes for the vice president? Do you see them going to Lenny Robredo? I look at both yeah, of you. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's very hard to say because uh, we We've really voted based on personal personality. Never on platform. It's very difficult really to say that we vote on based on platform. That's true. Here's true. what, well, you know what I think about talking about it as personalities. Uh, but what I think about the CCT, unfortunately, the ethical behavior that was the. CCT was really not politicized. It was a very yes. conscious sure. effort to not politicize the Four Peace Program, that it is not an Aquino administration program. It is a social welfare program. Yes. It was, yes, right. right? Is that so, the reality? And so now, well, that's the reality. Okay. Because it was now started by Gloria Arroyo. It was started by Gloria. Right. Yeah, the spirit of it is it should cross administration. <coughs> okay. it's, it's the government's yeah. program. So you, you, they can't rely on those votes because it's, it, because it was never packaged as a daang mituwid program. Yes. Right? So th now that it is being packaged as such. Now. now. But if, yeah. if, you know, the way patronage politics is done yeah. locally is you start packaging it in the beginning, which is the uh, right way of doing it is okay. not packaging it that way. So they did the right thing. They did the right they thing. They did the right thing. But they can't count on those votes. Huh, that's, that's the consequence. Wait, can I ask can you that? about uh, the role? You talked about this a little bit, that the participation is different in this day and age. Specifically, I want to ask you about social media. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These are the first elections. No one seems to know what to do with social media yes. or how large or how little a role social media will play. What is your sense of this? My sense is social media plays a large role mostly because it's such a close race for the top spots. Right. If this was a race where there are 10 points from each other, social media wouldn't play that big a role. Yeah. Uh, because we have mm -hmm. this silo effect where we're, sure. we're reading things on our feed that agree with us already. And then we have maybe 35 to 40 percent on the internet, maybe 95 percent of them on Facebook, yes. mm -hmm. some of them not regularly. So as a percentage, it's not that huge. Sure. But if we're talking about a vice presidential race that's in a dead heat, with the third person at uh, three points behind, that is going to make a large difference. In the same way the OFW vote now, which is worth one more than a million voters, if it wasn't a close race, wouldn't be important. But now it's very important. I think social media serves as a trigger 
mm. for discussion, yeah. uh, which the issues are picked up by the so-called mainstream media. Yeah. But notice that uh, the politicians place their ads on TV, not on social media. There, there are some on You know where they place it? On Facebook and YouTube. Facebook and then they and actually YouTube. wind up taking uh, the news reports and pushing that out as ads. It's very, very interesting to watch behavior right now. But go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just... There are, there, but the lion's share is on television. That's, that's correct. right, because uh, when we interview com the people behind the campaigns, they say that they need to put their ads on TV. I said, why not social media? Because they said that TV is still king when That's it comes right. to yes. voters' basis That's for right. decision making. And That's yet, right. one of the campaign managers actually just said that they don't know what works right now because TV is not working. Right? Oh, so, seriously? Yeah, th oh. And this was two days ago because I was like, so, so how d I was asking them mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. saw it. So it's so tight nice. now. I guess, so, yeah. so what, what else do you see, Marita? Well, I. It begins, some, it begins in social media. Yeah. And then it's picked up. So it's a very, uh, uh, it's a catalyst, it's a trigger, it's, it's a starter. So it, everything seems to be taken off from social media. But as to how this will impact mm -hmm. voters, yeah. I don't know, it still remains to yeah. be seen. Right? No, does it matter that the penetration, internet penetration rate is just 40%? Does it matter? Yes. You know, I, I would uh -huh. also say this, it's this, a yeah. little bit more than that because uh -huh. you have things oh, okay. like free Facebook. Oh, the, that's course. the number, right? right? Oh, internet, yes, yes, yes. Um, the, uh, the internet penetration rate is 40%. Yes. Yeah. But internet uh, access, I think. Internet, internet access. access. Yeah. Mobile phones yes. now can access free Facebook. That's right. right. So that comes yes. in through internet.org, which brings it up much more. And we can Maybe, see the yes. difference in, in engagement because the guys coming in on free Facebook ask you to put the entire article there yes. on Facebook yeah. so they don't have to pay right. for it. Right? So right. I, I don't know. Yes. Well, no, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think even the people behind the campaigns are all assessing. So they really yes. don't know whether social media mm -hmm. will play a, mm -hmm. a large role in this campaign. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the great free marketplace of sure. ideas. Sure. You know, you have sure. you have videos that are homemade that become viral that can change. That's right. You have videos of candidates that that are taken on with a smartphone and put on Facebook and can change anybody's mm -hmm. vote. Sure. May, may, may I share something from our research? Yes, yeah. please. We'd love. So, so, <laughs> so, I'm not promoting our research, but no, it's, I it's like my should. Should. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> serious. Please, that means you studied it. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, it's just interesting that, uh, yes, we're talking about the internet, but the top three sources of um, reliable information for for, um, this is around the country, but this survey was done towards the end of last year, yeah. are still television news, radio news, and TV interviews. And um, uh, in Tacloban, where I am doing the ethnographic research with my um, RA, um, it's really the radio. Because TV, yeah. not everybody has TV, right? But yeah. but if you, um, so this is an affected community uh, by Typhoon Yolanda. Yes. So, so radio is what they have. Uh, yes. So more likely than they do uh, television. And so whatever they hear from radio, and normally these are local radio stations, um, shapes um, their opinions. Um, of course, we've got informants who have their own internet cafes or, or, or who could pay for, you know, the young piso internet cafes for every five minutes. Um, and we've got young people accessing information from, you know, from the internet like that. But many of our other informants um, would be hard pressed to, you know, log on the internet and, you know, uh, go on Facebook and, and, and you know, click, you know, look for this particular candidate. Whereas you just turn, you just turn on the radio and it's there. Yeah. Real politique, I suppose, is, 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 is what happens on, on radio. Interesting, Clarissa, do you see the balance? Is there a shift already? Is it still primarily radio? So this is from Takloba, and that's the research. Radio, mm -hmm. radio is tricky because radio is local. So from, uh, running a, from a perspective of running a campaign, it's very right. inefficient to go through radio because then you have to have your candidate go to each of these radio stations. And then in any local radio market, there are several players and they're right. competing with a larger radio station that's in the big city. Uh, so when you pick radio stations to, to guest interview on, it's not clear what your exposure is going to be. You don't get repeated the way you get repeated on television. So on television, if you give um, an interview in the cable news show, you will end up repeated in the 6 p.m. Uh, prime time yeah, broadcast and you get you know you get slices of your interview done here and there and then it's across the country so there's a scale okay. concern when okay. you are planning the campaign 
And that is the limitation of radio, is how do you achieve scale, scale right? And on the internet, it is easier to achieve scale in the style of radio because oh, it's so cheap mm -hmm. to do a YouTube video. It's so cheap to get in interviewed by anybody, right? And then, but, you, but then the strategy becomes how do you get it out there to get as many eyeballs uh, in the internet you know, version of it uh, as possible. I want to toss this to you. This is from Carlo Ople. Hello, Carlo. Oh, hello, there, Carlo. Carlo. And uh, he is the uh, uh, managing director of Dentsu Digit. And mm -hmm. he actually mm -hmm. says that he's watching us now, but he, the money is being spent on social media, he says. But he'd say 70% is on black ops. Mm, the trolls. Do you see yes. this? The trolls. Seventy percent of social Carlo, media. I'm you. Yeah. Of social media spending. Social media spending. He says he'd yes. say seventy percent on black ops. Yes. We see a lot of it, uh, and you know we've seen, for example, cyberbullying yes. that's happened because yes. of that. That's yes. triggered. We see something very methodical yes. in, in yes. the way it works. Yes. What's your reaction to this, and how? What's its impact? Uh, it's hard to. Fathom 70% of how much on social yeah. media. But anyway. Of uh, what's being spent on, on the internet. Goes, on to the internet. goes to social media for black ops. He said 70% is on black ops. We need to get your data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking of ra what you said about radio. I think we just targeted really, as you said, for very specific areas. Because yeah. I, I remember the campaign of Jojo Binai when he was running for vice president. He was very, uh, he targeted areas uh, where radio was king mm -hmm. and he would use radio. Right. I, I think it's just the way Serge Osmeña also does his campaign. Right. They go to areas where maybe TV is king okay. and then radio is king, then they use whatever medium is dominant in that area. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. May I respond to Carlos' uh, yeah, question? Yeah, please, please. Um, I'll be a bit um, appreciative of these trolls, to be honest. How come? Because Research shows that saboteurs, the dissenter, the dissenters, define people's opinions mm. very well. Oh, how interesting! Right? Yeah, um, they're forced um, to take a position. That, exactly. Right? Um, even in the sociology of generations, right? Well, young people become more clearly defined if they've got a big enemy out there. But if right? the trolls were intelligent, oh well, and convincing. Oh. But the, the, the trolls the, the, that we see, the, the, but we, we can see the trend, right? We just mm -hmm. we, we have it here. Yeah, people's yeah. dispositions are changing um, every time there's a survey that is run. It's much more volatile right? than before. It's exactly, right? exactly. So the, yeah, this is not like the U.S. or maybe uh, England, which yeah. has you know countries which have clearly defined political parties, yes. and it's either you're a Democrat or a Labour or whatever, right? Uh, in the Philippines, you're beholden to personalities and the messages that they send. So. Just on the black ops. Go, go, go. <laughs> Assuming I understand the, correction, the, the question correctly, which is 70% yeah. of the spending spend. on social media specifically is for black ops. Actually, it's unclear. It's and unclear. Carlos, send me a message back. He said, <laughs> yes. money is being spent on social media, but I'd say 70% is on black ops. Right. So yeah, yeah, my yeah. understanding of that is, of the slice that goes to social media, 70% 70 of that goes ops. to black ops. That, that could be true. That yeah. sounds believable. Yeah. And yes. I yes. would believe it, especially because black ops needs to be very safe from, it needs to be separate from the actual candidate. Correct. And that's very hard to do on television. It's hard to do on other media. It's easier to do on Facebook. Uh, and where, when you have any budget spent for black ops, sure. it, it sounds very sinister. Uh, it's really negative campaigning, right? Yes. You, when you have budget for negative campaigning, it's easier to spend it on social media because it's easier to hide who is funding it. Yeah, correct. Uh, so as a strategy, it is you don't you probably won't have television spending that's negative campaigns because yes. you don't want it to connect it's with so, yeah. your can, your candidate. That's, 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 he he that's responded. True. Thank you, Carlo. He said, Thank take you, a look at all the boosted posts. Yes. That's so right. Yeah. Social media. Articles yeah. attacking yes. candidates. Sure. Yes. Rarely genuine promotional right. content. Okay. And Carlo sure. would know because he runs an agency. That's true. You yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carlo, you have stats you want to give us. Yes. That would be really interesting for study, Absolutely. for posterity. So, for posterity. So you, you think that that is believable. I mean, it yes, is. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And affecting the debate. Um, we have roughly uh, 15 minutes left, and I want to go to our reporters. Guys, are you awake? <laughs> I'm going to give you a mic. 
I want to go to our reporters. Which one do I? So part of it is because these guys have been following the vice presidential candidates like um, since the beginning of the campaign. And I'm going to turn to Pia Renada, who's been with the camp of the Duterte, so she knows Alan Peter Cayetano. Uh, tell us, how ready is Alan? What, what do you expect? What kind of campaign has he run? Um, well, being a senator, I'm, I'm sure Alan has uh, you know, the oratorical contest that will happen today. And um, he's pretty much raised on the politics. Um, his brother told me that he just prepares, he just prepared, like he would prepare for any Senate hearing. So he was briefed by his staff and then he read up on statistics. So um, I think Cayetano will do that because he's uh, very used to flinging statistics around like, in his speeches. He's the more cerebral between him and the very day. So he's the one who talks about platform more, uh, about how things will be done. So in terms of um, content, I think he has, um, he will have something to say. So why do you think he hasn't done as well as the as Bong Bong Marcos and uh, and oh sorry, why do you think he hasn't done as well as Bong Bong Marcos and Cheese Escudero? Um, well, one reason could be he's not very he's not as well known. His name is not as well known, especially in other parts of the Philippines. So he's he's known in NCR in Metro Manila, but if you go to Mindanao, if you go to Visayas, especially before the election season, he's not that um, famous a last name. Um, and also, uh, his running mate is one reason because uh, the Terrete tends to steal the thunder from anyone. Yes. Um, so if you're in the same room as the Terrete and you're trying to get attention, um, a lot of people are in those events just for the Terrete and would rather hear the Terrete for an hour than uh, listen to anyone speak for five minutes who they don't know. So a lot of the times, um, Cayetano is sort of a, a sidekick, like to the side a bit, and then the Terrete sort of is the, is the man of the hour and people don't really... Um, aren't really there for Cayetano. But um, if you saw the, the survey numbers, um, Cayetano is now first place in Mindanao, according to the Lilo Paul. So um, I think it's also Duterte's influence. Uh, so in that sense, it's also a blessing to be Duterte's running mate because, of course, um, being his bailiwick, Mindanao will follow whoever his running mate is. So it's both a good thing and a bad thing. There's gossip and, <coughs> and uh, speculation that Duterte is also swinging Bong Bong Marcos. Do you s did you see that in the campaign trail at all? Um, well, when he visited Lawag, yeah. um, we saw him uh, socializing with Amy Marcos. He visited the grave of uh, the, the mausoleum of Marcos. Uh, and we saw a lot of supporters who are Duterte Bong Bong. Mm -hmm. They really rallied when he was there. And Cayetano was not in Lawag. So um, even if Duterte hasn't really said anything, um, announced any support for Bong Bong like officially, yeah. uh, his supporters are very loudly for Bong Bong. Many of his supporters are loudly for Bong Bong, even the ones in Mindanao, because we have a lot of Ilocano migrants mm. in Mindanao, so they support Bong Bong. So I went, I was in Davao yesterday, and I could I could see Duterte Bong Bong posters in many areas, even if there were also many Duterte Cayetano posters. In interesting, we will go back with that. All right, then, segue to natin. Ati Pashon has been following. Look, we, I like this because we can wheel. <laughs> Patty has been following Bong Bong Marcos. Patty, what has it been like following this man and uh, what do you expect today? Well, following this man, because I graduated from UP, so I have a lot of insights about martial law Please. and it fascinates me how the people are very fanatic about him. Uh, when I ask them, why are you supporting Senator Marcos? Uh, they would say that because of his father, we miss the days when during the administration, there were jobs, the, uh, the economy was good, uh, the prices were low. Similar to Actually, it's very, for me, uh, when I see Senator Marcos, he's trying, he's trying to keep himself away from the image of his father. He, he rarely speaks of his father and his family in sorties. More of he's trying to establish that I'm uh, his own accomplishments, like being the chairperson of the Senate Committee on Local Government. But the people they keep reverting back that this is the son of the of President Ferdinand Marcos, and we want that administration back, so we're voting for him. Oh, interesting. That's actually what you said, Jail. Exactly. So she's seeing it on the ground. Exactly. Um, what do you expect from Bongbong Bong Marcos well, in this debate? I'm expecting that. Uh, Senator Marcus has been good in the uh, in debates and in speaking in the public. Like for example, in the go in the go negotiation forum, he knows his statistics, he knows the data. But I guess uh, what's lacking is his action plan because he just keeps on saying that we need this, we need that. But there has really 
been no specific uh, action plan how he's going to uh, go about his plan so maybe we can uh, take note of that and also I have heard uh, a tip from the camp that uh, because Senator Marcus has been very safe in his answers like uh, when he's asked about the martial law and uh, President Aquino's criticisms of him he's very safe in his answers but now I think they're switching or shifting to be to show a more combative side of Senator Marcos. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Great. Patty Pashon's tip for Bong Bong Marcos. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. We're going to go back to you. Swap chairs. Let's go. <laughs> Camille Elamia has been following the campaign of Grace Poe and Cheese Escudero. Tell us about Cheese. I mean, you've seen from when he's so high down to where he's dropped, but still at, at, at high. What do you expect? What, what has he been like on the campaign trail? Covering Cheese Escudero is like covering baseball because one, they, they usually campaign together more, more often than not and they have the same platform and usually they really have the same stand on different on all the issues. The same? And well, we cannot deny it, they sound the same, they sound similar. <laughs> and also, if baseball has FPJ, Cheese has Heart, heart. Evangelista. <laughs> and he never fails to mention Hart or even allude to her in his speeches, and the public likes that. They usually scream upon hearing the name of Hart. And as for the statistics now, that they're statistically tied, Bong Bong Marcus and Cheese Escudero, we, we tried to ask him several times about it. Of course, he wouldn't say that he, he's threatened, but we can see that there's a change in the strategy of Cheese and the tandem, because now, they campaign separately, like he focuses on the areas which he has to improve on and Grace does the same thing. And he admitted that they had a change in strategy a month after the start of the campaign because of the feedback from the ground and also with the, with the numbers. And he keeps on saying that for him to be statistically tied or close to Bong Bong, who is the son of the, of the late of the late president Bongbong Marcos and Bongbong uh, Ferdinand Marcos was the was the boss of yes. his dad mm -hmm. so for him to be uh, tied tie. with, yeah, yeah to have to be tied with uh, Bongbong Marcos it's a, for him it's already a big deal because it's the it's the boss of his father the son of the boss of his father the son of the boss of his father yeah. okay so what what do you expect to see from Cheese today. Cheese has always been prepared in speaking in public and he's used to debates in the Senate. I covered him when it was the RH bill, the syntax, and he's used to doing that. And it's quite interesting to see how the four or the five senators will be on the floor today because they also exchange uh, these, they also do exchanges on the Senate floor. But this time it's as vice presidential candidate, so it's interesting to see how they will do. And we asked Cheese Escudero how he prepared for this debate. And he said he just read up on the latest and he talked to experts to brief him about the latest in economics and in economy and also in poverty, things like that. So the topics that will be discussed later. So that's Fantastic. It. Thanks, Camille. We're going to go back to you. Okay, so you've, you're trying to figure out what happened to Lenny Robredo and everyone else. <laughs> for that, we're going to go to Rappler's managing editor <laughs> this way. Glenda Gloria. <laughs> Glenda, Hi, tell Maria. us about... Uh, yeah, I'm not covering Lenny. <laughs> 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 but unfortunately, our reporter is covering her, Bea Kupin, is um, in this post right now. Oh. Well, I guess for one, she's the only woman who's running um, for vice president. She's the only non-senator in the race. And she has a good narrative, um, her life story, and both also her short uh, political career. So I guess in that sense, she's a fascination and she's, she stands out in terms of those uh, unique elements in the campaign. And just recently, if you review the campaign sortie, she's the only one who has braved the lion's deck then, so to speak, Ilocos Norte. She did spend a couple of days there uh, campaigning right in Marcos country. So, so that's how she has braved it. She has taken a, a, a different stand from Marojas, for example, in the case of the Kidapawan farmers. Right. And it's not messaging on her part because she was a lawyer for uh, farmers groups um, uh, when she was a, a farmers lawyers before. So it's not as if um, uh, this was uh, just messaging or branding on her part. Is her performance a surprise to you? No. 
I think largely because um, she she is different in that field of vice presidential candidates, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess um, Filipino voters would, uh, I mean, love her story. She's um, she was uh, widowed. She lost her husband. Um, she was forced to join politics. Uh, Filipinos love that kind of, of narrative. And a, then, a reluctant candidate uh, from uh, day one. And then Trillanes and Gringo Onasan. What do you expect from them? Well, it's fascinating to see, that, to see them on the same stage. Yeah. Uh, we <laughs> have to recall that uh, Trillanes looked up to Gringo uh, for many years. Uh, he, he looked up to him as his mentor. Uh, they're both former coup plotters. Yes. Um, um, Trillanes was just a, a very young man when Gringo staged um, coups against uh, not just Cory but also against uh, um, and then of course Honasan was partly forced to go underground under the Arroyo administration on suspicion that he was the one who bankrolled and supported the Oakwood mutiny, Oakwood which Trillian is led. And now they're yeah. running against each other. I don't know if they are truly running against each other, but that's another matter altogether. So, yeah, th those are two former soldiers, but uh, I'm not surprised that they're not really performing well in the surveys because they've, they've not been active and it remains a mystery why Tr Trillian is run for BP. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we're on the same feed, you're going to get the, the debate, which should start in a short while. Um, let's just quickly go, just a, a quick summary from each of you guys right before we go on. Let's start. Jail, go ahead. A uh, summary right before we go to the <laughs> you, you want to be surprised. You were surprised. Why don't I go toss to the <laughs> journalist, Mr. Teresa, and then can you go? Awesome. Yeah, just in terms of what you expect now. We're, okay. we're going into ah, the debate. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm not so. taking Trillanes and Honasan seriously. First, Trillanes has no presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. He's running solo, an orphan VP. Mm -hmm. And what bothers me is that they can go back to the Senate if they lose. Yeah. Uh, Gringo was a last-minute um, choice because there was no other choice for Binay. So these two, I'm really not uh, taking them very seriously. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, so the three, I think, the three other candidates, uh, uh -huh, we have, uh -huh. uh, I really want to watch Escudero, Marcos, Robredo, and Cayetano, the four, okay. and how they'll yeah. perform. Carissa. I'm excited uh, yeah. because the first the first presidential debate was a game changer in a sense that it made the debate an event. Yeah, absolutely. And we could see from the polls the debate can swing these numbers right, yeah. four or five percent either way, up or down. Uh, and given that it's it's a dead heat across two or three candidates, this debate can be the catalyst for Fantastic. where the rest of the vice presidential That's race is going to go. That's right. In fact, I, yeah, I do agree with Claire. Looking at the trends, right, we have seen that uh, there are top two candidates. But the truth is, if we factor in margin of error, most likely the, the differences are not really statistically significant. What so this Lenny is in the running. I, as I well think as so. Okay. I think so. And I'm also looking at the other surveys that have been done just recently. And then uh, what we call statistical tie, right? This is right. present among uh, more or less the three of them. So therefore, it is very important for these candidates, if they're listening to us right now, it's very important for them to really be very clear with what they want to achieve. Wonderful. Okay, we're going to be switching to yep. CNN Philippines and their coverage, the, the vice presidential debate. Stay on this feed. We're switching now. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.